Well, let's get into picks and bans for game two and see if we can see some adjustments made from both teams. Maybe Space Station will work out what a magical damage deal it looks like. But at the same time, we'll also see if Sanguine can answer back that quick destruction of them to be fair it was really the pressure of the two hunters as well as the front line causing problems where the hunters double hunting allowed them to shred through the tower so quick yeah oswald might not have had the greatest laning phase and by that means it's jingwei i mean jingwei is not going to do much in the lane with a phase. jab as well <laughs> exactly yeah. he's just there to look pretty and hit the towers but this time around things could be a little bit more problematic because sanguine are already looking to destroy one of the main threats from game one, that Bakasura. Yeah, straight out with the Bakasura, King Arthur and Najar from Space Station Gaming. Sanguine will take away the Freya. No real surprise there. But the question is, what does Space Station Gaming draft first? Vamana? If it's not broke, why, why try why and fix, fix it? it? Yeah, I mean, Vamana could be a really strong choice here, and that's going to be the first go-to. Uh, and I love this because it's so versatile between Mask or Uzi. I, I think that either jungle one of them solo, could play yeah. it in jungle or solo and still... Uh, have a pretty strong performance on it, but this is a really interesting early response from Kepri, yeah. or from Sanguine. Going for the Kepri kind of leads me to believe that there might be a possible dive composition to follow from Sanguine, but seeing the Jingwei, I think Sanguine just intend to try and make this game stretch a little bit later. That's a good point. I think Sang Space Station Gaming was so fast and off the pace there, that it's so quick that they were trying to keep it going. The Sobek, very early in the draft for a Sobek, we've not seen too much of it lately, can be put in the solo lane, but gives the game away a little bit there. Can be running support too. I feel like Sobek's weird to take though into a Jingwei. You know the Jingwei's there, so yeah, you're the not gonna really right? you're not gonna be able to focus her ever because tail whip and pluck only help her uh, mm -hmm. for escaping. So that's uh, uh, strikes me a little bit odd there, but the Hachim and the follow it up, that's a pretty consistent uh, duo lane, if this is meant for the duo lane. I'd have to assume so though, because Vamana being locked in. I think that that's guaranteed well, to go for Uzi or Mask. I don't see Mas Uzi playing Sobek. I do not see Mask or uh, <laughs> Uzi true. playing Sobek. That's, that's the true. thing. I'm certain that that's for Maddie. Love the Erlang Shenban from Sanguine because I'm still not confident that Erlang couldn't come out to play right now, especially because we saw Mask do it last week, as you said, and Sanguine did ban it in game one. Raijin from Space Station Gaming just to try and limit some of the magical options. And Hera, someone that doesn't hasn't seen too much play overall, even though she's been left up quite a lot. I think I wasn't expecting that from her this year. But the Hera, the Hera Benaway, I think, is just in case because Sengwen do have a little bit of area denial right now with the Susano. I think Kepri, in a sense, can kind of work as a denial factor also yeah. because you know you can't just all-in commit whenever there's a Kepri on the table. You always have to be under the assumption that a Scare's Blessing can come through at any moment for a low-health character. But the Agni for Shinto, Agni Susano, that's a pretty potent... Definitely. And a Raven alongside it. So this is going to be Sobek support more than likely. Vamana in the solo or jungle with Raven in the other one. I guess it's Raven jungle, Vamana solo makes a lot more sense. Sanguine then still need a solo lane for themselves to maybe deal with the Vamana here. It's going to be a Kumbakana lock-in. So Kepri or Kumbakana solo, who would you prefer? I think that I would probably prefer the Kumbakarna, and also I think that that's just to be expected yeah. because Sanguine, that's their solo laner, loves running the Kumba. But uh, as far as the compositions are concerned, I, I think Sanguine is a lot of lockdown. I, I think Sanguine definitely won the draft, but can they win the game? The casters are standing by to bring you game two and see if Sanguine can take this to a third game. We'll absolutely bring you game two. Thanks, Hindu. Thanks, Taco. And it's going to be Jarkor on the Kumbakarna over in the solo lane. We haven't seen very many Guardian solos at all so far in Season 6. That's true. It's simply because you don't have the pressure to clear the wave and get the Totem of Ku at the same time with that new introduction in Season 6. Oh, here he is. you got to figure out what you want. Do you want the Guardian's They're Blessing gold this. per minute, or do you want to get that Totem? Yeah, they weren't expecting this at all. But a good dash comes out from Matty. Unfortunate, though. Because now he has Dash, which I doubt he wanted to have level 1. I think... Okay, so now that I see the Rising Dawn from Rongyu, there was no additional knock-up after the initial Kumba Karna route. Like, sure, he could have got knocked up, and Manipaka could have got knocked up, but I think if he still got rooted, he was still fine in that position. Since no one else took any other control. Yeah, right like, now. maybe if um, there was the Abduct, Right. Follow up, then that might have been a kill with the Naga. But it would have to be perfectly timed CC, and Matty Pocket would have to not get his pluck. Well, that is a free purple buff then coming out for Sangwen. And Jarkor actually backs and then teleports back in from the fountain and then comes and joins everyone else. So I wonder if he used that as an opportunity to buy that Boots 1. 
since he already had the chalice. They can come up with a little bit of extra movement speed. Also the health potion, so a little bit of extra yep. potions from that standpoint, as Uzi will confirm himself the first totem of Ku. Yarkor still working on it. Uzi can even clear the wave from the side. Pretty good. Still get the uh, better end of that guardian. Level 2, Benrongo and Netrade aren't really forcing the issue just yet. I mean, they've already gotten the purple buff, so you know what else is there to go do with your time anyway, even if you do pressure them out right away. But Sanguine, with that early start from the Soul Winner, yet again have established pressure. That's right. Oswald and Maddie Pocket tried to freeze the wave outside of the tower as they were losing the purple buff, trying to deny as much golden experience as possible. But this is the point where Sanguine have complete lane control. They're going to continue to get some poke damage with the Jingwei. Well, there's the Guardian in the solo lane for Sanguine, but it's the double... I can't say double warrior anymore. Now that Robin's been changed, can I? It's the Guardian, the warrior in the solo lane, and a regular old assassin for he's Mast still in the jungle. A God, he's still a warrior. He feels like it, doesn't he? Still. Yeah, you're right, but his base stats <laughs> have been changed to the point That's of an right, assassin. Yes. He has the abilities of a warrior, if you think about it, right? Like, I'm going to be melee range and punch you. And then I'm going to overhead cook. Overhead cook. Overhead kick. That'd be pretty good, though. I know, right? If you could cook Cooking. over your head and yeah, like, while you're wrong. I've been cooking, yeah. Yeah. And uh, doing damage and also in vol frames at the same time. Imagine Changa too, but better. It That's what Robin good, is. It? Yeah, because it, it does damage. Yeah. It's a pretty good ability. It's nice. <laughs> Who Can he also mana? dive on me? Can he also do that? You know what? I think that's a feature. Ro okay, I see. <laughs> Pretty good is uh, is Robin. Let's see if Mast can unlock his potential. Mast was critical, I would say, to their game one victory, right? Between him and Uzi, they, they really kind of ran that game from start to finish. They didn't have a way to slow down the Vimana and didn't have a way to stop all the damage coming from the Bakasura. No, definitely not. Panit, I'm getting the better end, I think, of Mask in terms of four stacks. Sorry, make that uh, five stacks, rather of the Assassin's Blessing. Nothing too crazy right now, but you could just kind of tell that there's just more clear early game from the Susano than the Robin. Looks like a bit of a Bancroft start here from Shinto. Looks like mages have a lot of options in the way they want to be starting too. I was very interested to see how mages would build coming into seasons because of a lot of changes to some of their core mage items, uh, especially in the penetration tree. We've seen cooldown boots rush. We've still seen Book of Thoth occasionally. Tiny Trinket from Scylla, that's a staple from her, and Bancroft still. You can even rush uh, Shoes of Focus, right? Like if you stay yep. in base long enough to do that, I think certain gods can do it. Chapo could have did that if he wanted to on the Scylla. You could just drop the crush over the wall while he's still running, but I think he would rather get penetration boots instead of Shoes of Focus, so he's not going to go for that build. Not this time. Because you have the 2v2 in the middle lane. Maybe not. Shinto's backing. 2v1. Nope. Even Mass is backing. 1v1. I eventually got there, totally. You did. Into what was actually happening in the We're game. on this journey together, Finch. <laughs> That's you know? right. We're all in this together. And it shows as we stand hand in hand. Yes. Make our dreams come. Sure. <laughs> I like what he's doing here, just trying to get this lane under the tower for as long as possible. Yardcore, see, he's in this weird position where he can't really, like, last hit because the Guardian's a blessing while he has to stack that up. So he has to allow the tower to kill it or keep the wave outside the tower long enough for his minions to do the dirty deed. That's exactly right. It looks like he'll be able to do that. Now, again, this is part of what this Totem of Ku is all about, right? This slower style that Guardians were able to do quite freely towards the end of Season 5 can in some ways be punished by a strong warrior, by getting that free gold for your team, an extra MP5. It's an advantage that's there for the rest of Space Station Gold, essentially handed over by the solo lane pick. That's true. But now that the Guardian's Blessing will be completed here, I believe after that wave, there's going to be 48 extra gold per minute coming to Yardcore's wave. Exactly. It's a bit of a, a bit of a put it in the oven, wait till it fully bakes to get that value out of it uh, for Jarcore towards the later part of the game. And currently he all, he's only down about 200 gold, so in about five minutes, they're going to be net neutral, and anything after that 10-minute mark of the game is all going to go Yarkor's way. Metroid's pulled back in, and Oswald's here. In fact, Mount Archer coming out as well, so the slow will land and the Heavenly Banner, but at that point, there really wasn't much potential for the kill. And remember, Jingwei, We'll be right back. The passive allowing That's you to it. basically fly back all the way towards your tier two tower yard core. Oh, yard if he really core. wants to, he can epic uppercut Uzi, get some damage off, and when Uzi lands, it'll also deal damage to the coup. That's right. Yarkor already now able to be the one that's controlling the coup. So a nice job 
by him, even up against the Warrior. I like Uzi dealing damage to Yarkor on the Kumbakarna in this game more than I like Uzi dealing damage to the Sun Wukong in game number one instead of the wave. Because in that point, without Yarkor having the epic uppercut, there's not much return fire from Yarkor, especially when he has to use his belly bump to clear the wave. And it's very easy to just stand in front of Yarkor to prevent that. And now that's his escape. Yarkor is able to find the root at the very least, though Uzi doesn't really have a way to fully lock him down. This is the cooldown boots that came out right away for Yarkor, so still not a ton in way of protections outside the Guardian's Blessing itself. Like, at that point, Uzi should be sitting... Be if he's going to be this aggressive, his best bet is to sit behind the archers, keep basic attacking him, throwing the 2-3 combos out every single time, forcing Yarkor to come out, or maybe forcing Panitum to make that early rotation, knowing that Yarkor doesn't have ultimate, knowing that Uzi still has his own. Two-man route with Panitum running up. Thought he might have some action, but Sanguine will wait even still. We're seeing Scylla being picked up, though, a little bit more often here, Tolly, and I'm surprised. So, uh, not a whole lot has gone Scylla's way. It feels like to make her better. Games are maybe a little bit longer, though, in, in people's experience in Season 6. Why do you think we're seeing a little bit more of her? Well, if you are if you ever watch Chapo stream, he's always <laughs> about the late game. He, he actually is. screams it quite often because of his early shenanigans. He's like, he knows he has such a strong late game right. that he can make those early game shenanigan calls. And it's a similar story in Scylla's case. She's all about the late game. The draft from Space Station Gold has a good amount of control with Matty Pocket on the Sobek. Mast has a root. Uzi has a knockup into a slow. So Chapo has plenty of options of when he wants to drop his abilities. Mast and Uzi appear to be waiting on if Yarkor will step forward. Maybe look for a gank opportunity on this right-hand side. And I don't know if Yarkor knows that is the belly bump used. And they absolutely are going to go in for the dunk. Knockup lands right into the root. But a two-man mess is good. Even the epic uppercut to get a little bit further away. And they get nothing else. That's right. Just now coming off of cooldown. Very unfortunate for Space Station Gold. See, the thing is, the uh, epic uppercut in itself is a shorter cooldown than most ultimate abilities. And then you add 10% cooldown reduction on top of it. It was a very easy escape. I was waiting for the overhead kick coming out of Mask and anticipating that Mez, but Yarkor playing it perfectly, catching both members, an easy escape. Yeah, that once he landed that Mez, then things looked so much better for Yarkor as Matty narrowly avoids getting rooted in the middle lane. And I'm a bit surprised that that's the first real gank attempt we've seen in eight minutes, and it was on the solo lane Kumbakarna. Now, he didn't have a ton of prot at that time yet, sure. and his ultimate might have been down, but still, we don't often see it. That's right. It's 35 protections coming from the Silver Breastplate, which is not the most in the world, but there's not that much physical power yet coming out of Uzi and Mast either. So just having Guardian stats in general sitting at level 9 allowed Yarkor to survive, and I don't expect Mast to show up in that solo lane anymore. No, no because that gank went about as well as you want, aside from the two-man Mast, and it still wasn't successful. So perhaps it'll look elsewhere. The problem is, it's a safe composition from Sanguine. Oh, that thought though, Uzi getting punished a little bit. Does have the knockup, allows him to reposition. And there's no threats in that direction. But look at Space Station using this opportunity to get the Gold Fury. I'm a monster Beautiful. to use just for extra damage, and Gold Fury goes down. Yet again, Uzi positioning himself almost purposely oh. on uh, such a bad position. This time now he's going to get punished for it. Yeah. I don't know why he went back to the left side of the lane, but a great knockup. Not enough because Benito still had the Typhoon. That sets up first blood for Sanguine, so they lose They lose oh, wow, that is first blood. but they grab first blood nine minutes into the game. I huh? just now noticed that that was the very first kill of the game. Well, I think it was our first gank. It was Mast <laughs> trying to attack Yarkor. It hadn't been a ton of action. Up I'm now. still riding the wave of the first game where there was, like, more action. Right. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, there's a couple kills that no. Well, the things, it does slightly favor Spaces, though. They were able to grab that gold fury. That means that the second fury, be it the Oni or be at the Primal. We'll be in rotation here now as Red Buff is up, and it looks like Mast wants to be here for it. It's just Shinto and Rongyu, but they can't take him down. You're going to need more than just Mask to kind of invade that Red Buff. You're going to need all four members of the dual lane to mid lane jungle not combination. Not anymore, right? <laughs> no, it's not the Bakasura anymore. He is the Robin, but he has Blink, so that's his intent, is to just trying to be a nuisance to Shinto. You can Blink in, get off the Prada Onslaught, get the root off on the Agni, and then as soon as that dash comes through, you drop the Mystic Rush wherever that Agni lands, and you're just going to be having a great time. No mana! Just enough for the dash. You are right, though. Oh, Very wow. low in terms of mana, but enough for the most important ability, which is the one that gets him out of danger. If he didn't have Shoes of Focus for the extra mana, I think Pen uh, Shinto was, like, dead to rights there. I think that that is, I think that is a fair point. 
He was in a dangerous situation. Now another big rotation from Space Station. There's no buff here. This must be perhaps looking for a kill. Not as big a rotation anymore as Chapo's no longer here. Maddie's around the corner, but they're standing Wards. over a ward. Everyone from Sanguine knows what's about to happen. The blue buff not due to respawn for about another 45 seconds or so. They will root out Panita. A great knockup out of us. He prevents the Storm Kata dash. Well, they definitely knew they were there. So, I don't know, Tully. What, what, what thoughts? Unfortunate. <laughs> it certainly was. Not a surprise, I would think, for Benito, but he no, does. Benito knew what he was yet. getting himself into. He expected <laughs> yeah. that he, okay, yeah, I'll get rooted, whatever. I'll just dash away afterwards. And then all of a sudden, here comes Uzzy, little baby, just knocking me up out of nowhere. And then back to the grave. That is an, un, as you said, unfortunate for Benito. That's not how, uh, how you wanted that one to go. But uh, that, that does show that Space Station's attention here on this solo side is starting to net some dividends as Mass takes a good bit of damage from Shinto, but there's. No more follow-up at this point, or at least not that wants to be committed, and Mast will get to walk away. I like how Mast just turns around and is like, throw another bomb at me. I still <laughs> got my overhead kick holding onto it the whole entire time after the abduct. So it just goes to show you the patience from Mast as a veteran jungler, the abilities that are still remaining. You're like, okay, the root was used, the abduct was used, so no more CC coming out of the Capri, only additional damage from the Agni. Oni is now completed for Uzi. And this is a lot of attention that's focused onto the solo lane this game. And I, I want to ask you about it because I wonder if it's just because it's a Guardian. Maybe they feel like they can't allow it a free pass into the late game as Chapo falls in the middle lane. Panitum had too much damage. Looks like three members there up against just right. him and Maddie. The Blink was used. Typhoon wasn't even necessary there. I'm assuming what happened was Blink, Wind Siphon, pull into a whole bunch of damage. Looks like Chapo didn't expect it coming either because there were no beads used either as Uzi goes into the big baby form. Maybe an attempt to try and chase down Shinto, but that's going to be it for this Pyromancer. That will no longer be happening. Not in love with the ultimate out of Uzi there. He doesn't get full value to chase down anything, really. So if Sanguine really wants to, they can sort of collapse onto this Vamana, knowing that ultimate's going to be down for quite a while. Max Marine stun land onto Mass, but as long as overhead kick exists, then um, it's hard for Rava to ever really be in any true danger. That's true. As it looks like that's probably how he got himself out of there on the back end. But an unfortunate spill for Chapo. That kind of stuff, uh, it can't happen. Just training out blow for blow uh, from the solo lane. I kind of want to see more plays out of Matty Pocket. They haven't had the opportunity, though, to really use him in some of these offensive plays. And the reason why I say I want to see him more out of him is because he opted for an aggressive relic. Going for the horrific emblem, you want to see him look for the plucks, maybe force out some beads, or at least force out the uh, heavenly sprint out of Rongyu. Well, after a, a deep dive in the jungle, looks like things have calmed down. Can we take a look, then, at how Chapo did take that spill, since it was something that happened a little bit further away. Looks like we'll have an opportunity to go back and see it. Yeah, Chapo, the way he died earlier on was a little surprising to me. Uh, so Panito blinks in, gets the wind siphon off. A lot of damage over time afterwards. The chat stream yeah. under the tower. Great display of mechanics out of Panito. Looks like he thought that the Sentinel was going to be enough, but unfortunately it was not as Shinto is able to dash away. Now it's Maddie Pocket, who might have gone a little bit too far forward. He's forced then into the lurking in the waters early on. Crush chunks Panitom and the red buff is secured by Space Station. That's what all this fighting was about. But taking a little bit too much damage was Uzi and Manny Pocket. So I think there could be a play for this next Oni Fury out of Sanguine if they really want to. They have an opportunity to at least go take a look. But Chapo still no buy and still has I'm a Monster, which can be quite good at trying to confirm it. It looks like Sanguine aren't going to roll those dice, at least not yet. So they fall back towards parity again. Another game that's been... Slowly played between these two, very much giving consideration to, to their engagements. That's true. But also keep in mind, even though Chapo does have um, a monster without Maddie Pockets lurking in the water, I think even forcing a 5-on-5 five five fight, or even a 4-on-4 four four excluding both soul laners, would still value, or favor Sanguine, rather. I think there's a good chance. It would be very risky for Chapo to come into ultimate range, as Uzi could be in trouble. Panitum now the one looking for a solo lane gank. But Uzi was able to escape the big baby form enough. He missed the third strike of the Storm Kata dash. I don't think it would have been enough, but it might have been a an accelerant to force the Typhoon afterwards. Maybe if he started charging that Typhoon during the epic uppercut, but just as I'm saying, oh, that Uzi still getting dove under that tower. That's because there's no ultimate that second time. They're able to come in and dive the baby no problem. Now three to one in the kill column, despite still being down in terms of gold. Gotta imagine that early Gold Fury has something to do with that. 
as they finally clean up a kill over on the Vermont. Gladiator Shield, just not enough physical protections to really deal with that kind of a gank. Even though you're getting 3% per stack of your Oni's Hunter's Garb, 6% mitigation, not truly enough. There needed to be some sort of like breastplate of valor or something, like that level of physical protection to keep himself alive against Panitum's damage. And that, especially in that situation, even with the extra health. Coming out from Blackthorn Hammer, it wasn't quite enough as Maddie gets pulled in, and there's enough members of Sangwon here to maybe cause a problem. But one charge prey, and he's out of there. But Jarkor doesn't want to let it in here. They're pulling the Gold Fury while they're going to let the Kumbakarna on zoning duty. But needs him here as well to try and provide some control. He could use Lurking in the Water at any given Blink. moment. Uzzy blinking into the back line. There goes the Mounted Archery. Going to force Shinto to dash away defensively, but Mask is not giving this up. You had to use Scare's Blessing early on. Mass still far forward, but it's wrong you who's in trouble. He falls to Mass. No Scare's Blessing for himself. Typhoon from Phoenixum does hit home, but they had no chance to follow up. In fact, Mask and Uzzy are going to keep zoning away four members by themselves, and the Gold Fury looked at by the rest of Space Station. Good beats out of Mass to keep himself alive. Uzzy not done yet. Going to continue Good. to zone away for the moment. Chapo. Oh. Going to use I'm a Monster aggressively while the rest of his teammates are doing the Oni. It is good damage that chunked away at Jarkor, but maybe not onto the actual priority target that he wanted. But as you said, a Fury for Space Station, their second one now of the game, and an opportunity for them to push a little bit as Sanguine or really. That's very true. I think that they should be able to get this Tier 1 tower on the left-hand side anytime they want it. Rongyu has respawned, so he will be in position to rotate on. But no, Space Station Gaming not going to group up for that 500 gold on the left-hand side. Going to play it very safe instead. And that's what we've seen a lot, I feel like, in this set in this game and a half, right, is that if there are some skirmishes, some small fights or one or two people die, no one's really forcing the issue on the backside of it. They'd rather just fall back, wait for another engagement and see if they can win it by a wider margin at this point. It seems to be the case, especially when Choppa's winning the race to level 20. He's at a good pacing to out DPS Shinto, especially with how aggressive Uzi has been on top of mass, forcing Shinto out of the equation. That last team fight, Rongyu, had to use his ultimate really early, and I think it was on Panitum. Already, two anti-heal options available for Sanguine, though. Brawlers and the Divine Ruin. I gotta imagine. Those have Uzzy's name on them and a way to try and limit the impact from this big baby who doesn't have haste and katana yet. So maybe not quite the same chase down that we saw last game. And still a second relic slot available for Rongyu. I want to see the Cursed Onk, but I want to see it upgraded to really limit Uzzy's healing potential. Oh yeah, any kind of way you could blow up that baby would definitely help as Oswald in this situation should be able to get the tier one. Maybe not though, as the minions have now died and the tier one still stands. Maybe he didn't want it, you know? No, not quite yet. It's all right though. There's still gonna be another day for that tier one tower. If they can rotate, get this red buff, get this purple buff on top of it, that can set up for more than just a tier one tower. Maybe Certainly. winning a team fight, getting a pyromancer, or if they get enough picks, even a fire giant. They'll have that opportunity as they choose to pass up the tier one tower for now and fall back towards farming. Aside from that, everything else looking normal. We're getting double crit builds, though. No surprise from Netrio and the Jingwei whatsoever, but the Poison Star there for Oswald as well, even into a team this tanky. Jarkor, uh -oh. though, might be in some trouble. Ooh, forcing the blink out of Yarkor. Chapo off the mark with that root. He I like that Shinto blink. was timing that bomb stun, but Chapo having vision with the Sentinel elect is like, no, 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 not for me, not today. Well, Chapo has this blink. We better see some real big blink value out of it before we get too later in the game because Aegis remains a very good relic and uh, has not been picked up. That is a very bold move from Chapo, but Chapo's a very move. bold person in general, so he has the confidence in himself and his abilities. If he feels that he would rather make offensive plays with the blink, there's a reasoning for it. Maddie pulled back in into the bombs from Shinto, though he is quite tanky at this point in the camp. He pulled by Panitsu as well. But they don't want to full commit, not into a tanky Kepri at this point. Uzzy, though, could certainly be a target as he charges forward inside that ultimate. But Jarkor has kept Oswald out of the fight. Cursed Ankh was used onto Uzzy, but nobody's focusing him out despite all the anti-healing that they have. Divine Ruin was picked up. Brawler's Beat Stick. That could have been a missed opportunity onto Uzzy. Yeah, certainly a spread out fight, but they still have Netroid and Wrong Hughes 
those ultimates, some very safe options for Sanguine. Will not matter though, a space station claimed the Pyromancer for themselves. Shinto oh. forced to dash early on, and now might be a bit of a sitting duck as in aggressively goes next oh. on the Ravanama monster. Hits a bunch of people too, but they haven't brought anyone to kill threshold. Benitum finds one, Mask finds another, and Chapo takes down uh, Shinto. Three for one, space station gold are creating so much chaos in the back line. The umbrella rain gonna slow Keep out going. Yardcore. Uzzy needs to find the second hit. He's gonna take a lot of tower shots, and he doesn't have the time to get the kill. And actually, Netroid with the crit blows Uzzy up. Mast is quite low as well, but there's not a way for Netroid to continue on the chase. So yes, they lost three members earlier for one, but they got one more kill and cleaned it up. Oh my goodness, they can't even get the tier one tower because they had to try to bail Mast out of that sticky situation. Uzzy just had too much red in his eyes for a kill that he knew he was gonna get but there was a second stage to that kill. And right, he didn't I respect the rotation coming from the Jingwei. Well, he had to have known. They have not killed this Kuma Carnia. I guess they could, you could still have procked the passive at this point up until then, even though they don't have a kill on him. But it seems like they just weren't able to keep track of whether or not that passive was up. Because that definitely changes the viability of diving the Kuma Carnia to Tier 2 as Netroid got a nice crit and was able to punish. No agility from Netroid after knocking himself up with the Wing Gust or the Persistent Ghost, rather. So instead, just going to let Oswald back. Tier 1 Tower still stands strong on the left side. Actually, Tier 1 Tower on all sides out of Sanguine still remain pretty strong, but not very healthy. No, not at this point. As all the relics for Sanguine are down, that just goes to show you how bloody that last battle was, except for the blink from Yarkor. So that, that tells the story, right? Everyone used every relic except for the one where Yarkor would have initiated. They got initiated on in that last fight. They're gonna keep that one going as they knock up Chapo, but he sentinels right into the part where everyone's at, body blocked by Yarkor, and an easy kill. Still 60 seconds remaining on those beads. He just had no business being in that position. If he wasn't in combat, he could maybe blink away, but that was his only escape option. Now Primal Fury being pulled by Sangle. They've got Maddie Pocket locked down. I think he ends up charging forward. No, there he still has the charge prey to use. Has to go to Lurking in the Waters, and Primal Fury has been reset, but Uzzy is pushing forward with the Colossal Fury. Now they force out the Cursed Onk, but he's gonna turn his attention right towards Wrong Yu, who can keep on charging. Panitum finds Matty Pocket elsewhere, and now they gotta lock down the baby with no big ultimate form to change into. But they found two picks that they needed. Sanguine can reset this fight and still get healthy. Choppa will be back up to contest this Primal Fury, but Matty Pocket will not. So I think Sanguine will have a five on four advantage and probably try to abuse it. They need that Primal Fury buff if they want to make that objective on the right side of the map even easier. And it will certainly be easier if they're able to grab this objective. Netroid now rotating over to add some much needed DPS. The only one who could see this is happening is Oswald, but he's right on a ward and Panitum is gonna send him packing. This Primal Fury belongs to Sanguine. Well earned after a tough fight. A very well earned fight. Ozzy even backing to base. So Chapo coming from the respawn, making it an easy four on two. It was only Masked and Oswald that was within the vicinity of doing anything. And that really does start with Chapo getting punished in mid, right? Yes. And, and I think in a world where you've gone Blink instead of Aegis for your second Relic, if your beads are down, you truly, truly have got to make sure that you're mindful of your position. Even with Aegis, he still dies there. Yes, I agree. I think that he was just too far forward at the end of the day. I Unless agree. he, like, quickly blinks away. The Blink might have actually been better for him in that spot than the Aegis, <laughs> as long as he instantly yeah. blinks away once he realizes he was about to get engaged on. But either way, as a mid player, Chapo's mentality is usually aggressive. Oh, yeah. But in this case, he needs to be more passive. Well, there's the beads forced out yet again. It is traded for Yarkor's blink, though. So, so a little bit of initiation gone to make that Scylla even more vulnerable as Maddie Pocket takes quite a bit of poke, a little bit of healing from the sickening strike, and he's forced away. But Yarkor wants more, can't find anything with the Mez, but maybe he can with the Root. It'll land onto Mast, but that means Wrong Yu's got to eat a crush for the pleasure. And Space Station Gold hold for now. A lot of damage onto Wrong Yu, but also a decent amount return onto Maddie Pocket. Both supports are in a bad stick of it all, but into a blink into the left side. Mid RP's Panitum getting the Capri revive. It was right there from Wrong Yu. That's perfect to punish the dive, but Mask gonna loop around the backside of the fight. I think Panitum recognizes he's running away to the right, but Uzzy, he's going right down Main Street. He wants to try and wreck some havoc of his own. He's stomping on everybody that he can find, but the bomb's done from Shinto was even better, and the Typhoon for the knockup. Netroid gets a double, 
and they end up trading off a wrong use light. Why are they going all the way to the tier two tower? They got the tier one, but they're just over committing now. Chapo trying to get a blind ultimate through the wall. The root almost taking the life of Panino, but he couldn't get the crush afterwards. Well, now Netroid should have some help in the form of Yarkor, who's shown up. And they'll try to get out some return damage, but a one fight for Sanguine, three for one with Chapo. I perhaps recognize that he might just be dead to rights, trying to at least get some damage off in the fight, but he gets nothing there, and Sanguine win it. So with how aggressive Uzi and Mast was in game number one, they need to really pump the brakes in this game number two. They yep. baited the rest of their teammates into a bad situation. I like the fact that Uzi uses ultimate to tank the tower and force Shinto out into the tier two tower, but there's no reason to dive that tower while your backline is working on killing the first tier one tower. Oswald and Chapo were preoccupied getting the structure, which was the correct thing to do. They need to go for the tier one before they even w make their way towards that tier two. And the thing is, they did force out two members, Shinto and Panitum, but they're members who are still somewhat viable from range, especially if Panitum has the Typhoon available. That's exactly yes. what happened. He fired it over the wall after Shinto got a, a sick double stun, too. So, so against this comp, sometimes getting them out of the fight is good enough, but you got to make sure they're all the way out. And that time, Space Station went too far forward. That's right. So I think after losing that last team fight, that should be enough of a telltale sign that Space Station needs to slow it down, especially okay. now that they lost their lead, basically, losing the last Primal Fury, losing three members there, as Pyromancer was also stripped away. Sanguine are the ones with the lead. It's not much, but it's still, their confidence is now with them having that kind of momentum shift. And they definitely do need to to pull back because they have an opportunity to close the set out right here. Yes. If you can avoid the game through game three, you should, as Rongyu is able to dash away from any trouble from Uzi and Mast. Some nice crits coming from Oswald. He's got some too. It's not just Netrioid. But there's the blink three man mez from Jarcore to start everything up. Typhoon comes through a little bit late and Oswald's able to dash away. But Matty Pock is still kind of far forward. Trying to do something onto Yarkor. Maybe the root is there, but the pluck actually misses the Kumba Karna. Oh, I'm a monster, though. Comes over the top. That sets him a kill, but Netroid responds. A double for Chapo. Make it a triple for Chapo. There's the aggression of the mid lane mage. He's going to keep it going, even if no one else wants it. As he finds one on Arongyu, that's four members down for Sanguine. And now Oswald going to start the Fire Giant objective. Will be the enhanced one. Space Station Gaming should be able to get this. Resetting the aggro onto your Vamana player. Chapo even assisting with the crush damage. A very important for kills. Now look at the difference there of the damage. That's Almost 12,000. A lot of that coming in the way of Chapo off of that triple kill. It absolutely was. More than double the damage and that's, you're going to win team fights that way <laughs> if you're doing that much more damage, especially on the critical targets. And I was worried about that one because Maddie's initiation wasn't perfect, right, to get that started. The, the pluck was off the mark and it looked like he was going to get blown up. But when, when Chapo's hitting shots like he's hitting, when Jarkor gets isolated too far forward and burned quickly, then Spacey's going to win Fights. That's true. And it was a great engage coming out of Yarkoi, unfortunately for the him. Blink mess, yeah. Nobody else was close enough to follow up. And there was a small window where Yarkoi could have still used Epic Uppercut onto Oswald because Oswald was holding on to those beats for as long as possible. He was expecting no CC follow up until he saw the Typhoon charge up. And that's when yeah. he had to pull the trigger there. And I think sometimes those blink engages can catch everyone off guard. I'm sure Jarkoi was looking for it, but it's hard to ahead of time say you're going to get a blink three-man mez because that's such a small window for when you can get it. Maybe there wasn't room for Panitum to be ready to Typhoon right away or for the rest of the follow-up to be there. He was kind of far forward, too. It just was unfortunate they couldn't completely capitalize on a really good initiation. That's true. I think Panitum could have blinked a little bit faster to follow up from that right. engage, and that would have been really crucial because it's not every day you have three members grouped up in such a manner that you can get any form of CC, especially when an ADC is part of that three-man grouping. Yeah, you got to feel good about that fight. Now, after having seeded some of their early victory totally, Space Station are back in control, about an 8,000, even maybe even more gold lead. Yeah, 8,400. 6700 experience, though that's meaning less and less as we approach the 30 minute mark. And they're going to grab this tier 2 tower as well. Sanguine have completely fallen back to their Phoenixes for defense. Going to be an easy siege for at least a tier 2 tower, but is it going to be easy for the Phoenixes? Shinto with Agni bombs. 
That's not scary. that much cooldown reduction. 20% between Shoes of Focus and the Spear of Desolation. Yarkor has plenty of control. This next engage has to be perfect from SSG. Oh, I think that this is a, a dead Uzzy. I mean, a blink mez right surrounded by four. But look at the damage coming on the Netroid. They do drop down the rest for him, though, as Mask able to find Shinto to make it at least a one for one. And Sanguine quickly have to fall back to their Phoenix. Yet again, Uzzy trading his life for Shinto. Similar story to game one when Shinto was playing the Vulcan. Makes the siege a little bit easier. But look at Benito in the back line, keeping Oswald Priyak. Occupied. Yeah, and Mass dunks on top of him with the Robin Ultimate, but Netrolite finds Oswald. Big time crits coming out from the Jingwei as she puts on the Hurt. It's three up against three, but at this point, SSG have already got the Phoenix on left-hand side. Right. You can fall back. That's right. They can't realistically end quite yet the same way they did in game number one. So they're going to count their lucky stars and look for this middle wow. Phoenix with a whole entire wave. They don't even have a Hunter, though, so this damage is going to be a lot less than what they're used to. Mez onto Chapo, Epic uppercut, and Netrolite can be right there for the follow-up. Gets rooted as well, and Chapo has to leave. That's all the damage. Now Maddie pulled back into the Phoenix and the burn begins. Oh, no. Yes, Jarkor goes into the passive, but he the has the Mez. He has the Mez as well. That means Mast cannot complete this kill. No, he's going to try though before he dies, oh, but the no. revive happens and Mast oh, is no. going to fall as well. Wrong you. Going to be the focus fire. Uzzy teleporting back in. He uses the big baby, but he's going to have to back on off. It just took a little bit too long for Space Station Gold to transition from that left side Phoenix into the mid. Yeah, this is a timeline I I don't know if we should be in at all, really, totally. Once you got that left side Phoenix and realized you left Oswald, I mean, do you necessarily have to go in for the 3v3 underneath the mid Phoenix? Uh, they had the wave. See, that's, that's the they thing. Did. They yeah. did have the wave, but the problem was when you don't have beads on Chapo, the cooldown of Yarkor is just so short. It is, isn't it? That it's crazy. You have to actually even take that into consideration and maybe even scrap the idea of going for the middle Phoenix to begin with. I'm right there with you. And Yarkor's initiations have been great this game so far. 1 0 oh, and 12 on this Kudmakarn in the solo lane. They tried to pressure him out earlier in the game but it was nowhere near enough to stop him from getting to this point oh, yeah. where he's such a nightmare. When he blinks in into Chapo and finds the Mez early on into the epic uppercut, that's the way that fights for Sanguine need to be starting for them to win. It's just easy claps for Yarkor if he's going to blink into that back line because of how short those cooldowns are. Even trying to make it happen with a stone of binding. If he's going to get those three-man messes and reducing protections by 15, it's going to go a long way, especially with the long distance shots out of Shinto. Well, the Fire Giant should be back up shortly, Tully, and I imagine that's where we'll see the next big grouping out of both of these teams. And even with that left side Phoenix down, I, I don't know, I feel like Sanguin should make sure they're here for the defense on this one, Tully. Should they give it up, or do you want Sanguin here? For the Fire Giants? Oh, yeah, even left side Phoenix down. I think they could. They did push it out long enough to the point that they could contest it. Because these team fights aren't lasting that long. That's true. It's, they're like lasting 15 <laughs> to 20 seconds top. So, like, I say defend it, honestly. Yeah, people are getting blown up one way or the other, right, in these battles. Uh, having a Silo on your team, especially one as aggressive as Chapo, I think can do that. He does have Book of the Dead now, though, which should give him a little bit of extra life in these engagements if he does end up being the target, which he has been so far. Uzzy forced to dash out. And now we reset. Time to do the dance of the FG. I feel like Book of the Dead was almost forced because he didn't go Aegis, so it sacrifices yeah. his DPS. Mask blinking into the back line, gonna force Netroid to disengage. Gonna knock up Mask even with a Typhoon, overhead kick, but who's the target now? It's gotta be Netroid. Yeah, he's had his ultimate forced out already, which makes him a perfect target for someone like Uzzy. But Uzzy is very far forward without the rest of his team. Crush was in a good spot, but no one walked into it. And that means now Spacious can fall back to the FG without having to worry about Netroil's ultimate, but he has both relics. They're going to force this because they know how close these fire minions are to the Titan room out of Sanguine. Still going to reset it for the moment. They don't have complete vision control right there. Netroid's ward stands in the pit. Two members are backing, though, for Sanguine right now. It looks like both Panitum and Netrua, which means they'll be there to defend. And that information showing up on the map should be all that Space Station need to go. Netrua can get back quickly, but not Panitum. They can burn this quickly, but look at Uzzy. He's taking Uzzy a lot has of damage. no ultimate. He's taking so much damage, sitting at less than 50% health. Those oh, this is fire bad now. pits not looking good. Already goes in, what? and Sanguine steals it with the bombs. That was even with the crush there. This is a nightmare now, as Mast ends up falling on the right-hand side, forced into the ultimate as Chapo just to try and find a way 
way to get away. They defend the Fiends on the left-hand side, and they grab VFG. A big play for Singlet. Chapo getting a 13-37 wow. hit there on top of Netroid, but just not enough for Lethal. What a play from Sanguine and Shinto specifically to steal away that objective, keep themselves alive in this game, and more importantly, keeping themselves alive in this whole best of three set. They're going to take the Tier 2 tower in mid now. Maddie Pocket and Uzzy have to fall back and make sure they're ready to defend on this mid Phoenix. They're not entirely outnumbered. It's only mass that they've lost. They just had to make sure they played this one carefully. They still have defensive relics. They can definitely defend. They're trying to do whatever they can. Panita wrapping around the left side. Maddie Pocket gets abducted, knocked oh, up, and almost dead. Yarkor with the last hit. He wants to get his second kill of the game. Uzzy goes forward, but Typhoon's there to provide some extra damage. But in that big baby form, he's safe to make it out. Now it's time for the DPS onto the Phoenix Chapo. Got to be careful. He's holding on to the beads for now, but gets hit by the epic uppercut. And that means even with the beads won't be enough, he dies with them up. Yeah, he just did not really respect the damage at all as Panitum gets taken out by a good play out of Oswald. Yarkar with double. a double kill on top of Oswald. This could be all she wrote. Oh, I think Finch. it's over. I think it absolutely could be over. It's just Uzzy that's left. He doesn't have the big baby form either. And just like that, a game that was firmly in Space Station's control, a mistake on the mid Phoenix, mistakes around the FG could cost them everything as the Titan now below half health, below a quarter. They still have two wow. members standing. That's a Dia sign in the game for Sanguine. Tying the series up at one apiece. We're going into a game number three. Wow. I'm looking back at the tier one mid tower into the tier two overextension that was rough from too. Uzzy. It was several times as well because Uzzy was actually trying to get a kill onto Yarkor's Kumbakarna where he didn't respect the Jingwei rotation. And then the second time was it was also Uzzy and Mask diving the tier two tower after Shintu used that dash uh, defensively, whereas Chapo and Oswald was sieging that tier one tower. There was a huge disconnect between the front line and the back line from Space Station this game too. Yeah, it does feel like restraint kind of was the the, the missing factor here yeah. for Space Station because this game was in their control for most of it, especially the early, yeah. but a couple mistakes towards the end and ended up throwing that one away. At least that's how we saw it here as the casters. What about you guys on the desk? How'd you see that second game? Well, what I saw was a, a good old throw. That's what we saw there. <laughs> Space Station Gaming had a good chance of closing out that set 2-0 over Sanguine. But then, well, they missed around at the Phoenixes a little bit without a carry in the mid lane. And then the Fire Giant, we can look back at that in a minute. But the Fire Giant didn't work out well. Yeah, Sanguine, get it. Here's a little look at it now. Apologies for the audio there. But the crush is down, Taco. Let's just watch it through. Groggy strike from Jakor. I have to see what's stolen. Mask up, down, a bombs. Kepri. A good and Oh, it's Agony Bombs. It's Agony Bomb over the wall, right? Yep. But yep, that was Sheen with the bombs over the wall. Why was the crush? Did the crush not get detonated there? I I I couldn't tell. I, Can we I see wanna, one more time? I want to see that one no. more time, possibly because it, it just looks so close. I feel like it's definitely Sheen that gets it. I feel with that bomb. There's okay. the crush. Super slow and crush. It's there. looking it's looking perfect because even. Agni Bombs versus Scylla Crush. It just looked like he popped it too soon. He popped the Crush yeah, too soon. Yeah, way too soon. Way too soon. Underestimated the damage. Mask comes in with the, that last bomb that you just see landing there was the one that Shinto got just as he was getting plucked by Matty too. Wasn't enough, but that's how tricky the Fire Giant can be, and a mistake like that cost them the game straight afterwards. I Fire Giant cost them everything because on all the members. Chapo also used his ultimate. He used the I'm a Monster to escape and live because the fight that ensued after the fact, uh, a couple of... SSG was just sent scattering once they lost that Fire Giant toss-up. And without having I'm a Monster on defense, that mid-Phoenix siege down the for Sanguine was just all too easy to accomplish, I think. they, they just SSG had nothing left in the reserves. They threw everything into committing on that Fire Giant, and they didn't get the confirmation that they needed to. And I, I know that like for a team effort, it's it's rough. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's it's rough, but like straight up, Chapel has to secure that. Well, it's a 1-1 one, one scoreline now. Sanguine have another lease of life when they may not have got one previously or would have expected to. I think the one thing we can say about both games though is that Space Station are just running at Sanguine and Sanguine are having to backpedal consistently. I think in picks and bans this time round, they're gonna have to adjust that. Maybe take away the Vermana, it's causing a lot of problems.